Thank you. And I'm excited to talk about fishes. Um, I've been asking Haiku if I could talk about fishes for some time because I don't think the fishes are talked about enough. Um, and I will call them fishes, not fish, because they are individuals, not a collective. Uh, language is important when we talk about animals and in general with our activism. So most of the material uh, that I'm gonna be talking about today comes from the second chapter of Eating Earth, which focuses on fish. Um, the, the environmental books that I've written are these four, and in Eating Earth, the first one's on animal agriculture, the first chapter, the second's on fishing, and the third is on hunting. So I am gonna focus on the middle chapter. Once again, I try to use the word animal. Mostly it's a writing tool, but it's just important to me to talk about living beings as they are a collective. It is not humans and animals. Humans are animals. So I try to use the word animals when I talk about any species that doesn't happen to be the one of the speaker. So in this case, uh, any being who could communicate with us could use the term. And when they said animals, we would be included with the rest of the species. And the speaking being would not, if that makes sense. There will be uh, way too many archaic United States uh, ways of weighing and measuring, and so just brief reference that when I say three feet, it's about a meter. And if I talk about a mile, I think we all pretty much know that's 1.6, and a pound is about a half a kilo. And I, uh, sometimes I'll try to give the translation, but if I don't, in your head, hopefully, you can kind of find it for yourself. Before I start talking about fishes, I wanna be really clear that my topic has to do with people that look a lot like me and have kind of the same socioeconomic, industrial complex world of capitalism that I live in, and that uh, I am not prepared. I mean, I know as well as probably everyone in this room that these fish would rather be alive, um, but who am I to say that someone who needs fish and has nothing else to eat needs to quit eating fish because in my world that's possible. So I try to be very careful about just saying, I'm talking to people who look a lot like me and not about these folks. Here's roughly the topics that I'm going to cover today. I'm gonna to look at the methods. I'll first look at the fishes themselves, then methods, and then the industry, and a little bit on climate change. A brief view of aquaculture and sustainable fish before we open it up and talk amongst ourselves about fishes. And my main task today, my hope, is that when we're done, all of us will have kind of a collective sense of maybe some important things to bring to the table if we're talking to someone who is still eating the fishes. So um, here's some mackerel. And I've no doubt had something really critical I wanted to say about my particular approach, but you know, life's how it is and, and these mackerel are beautiful. So there you have it. All right. so. When I'm talking about fishes, one thing I'm really aware of, and let's go back to these fishes, is that we don't experience fish in the same way, the fishes, in the same way that we do, say, a pig or a dog or a giraffe, right? Because they live underwater. So when I come to talk about fishes, I can't come to you and say, oh, when I was a kid, I was walking home, I found this fish and brought it home. And I can't say, how, oh, there was a transport truck and I went along and gave the fishes some fish food. Right? I can't do those things when I talk about fishes. There's, some, there's kind of a gap between our world and their world. And oftentimes when we do see fish, it's like, oh, did you see that fish? Oh, did you see that fish? And in reality, we don't really see the fish. We might see a little water, we might see a bit of their nose, we see a little gray, it's so fast, we get the ripples and we're really excited because we saw a fish. So their world is really different than our world, but fishes, are people, and this is an important thing to remember. So the scientists did things like put something painful on a fish's nose so that they could see, let's see if this fish can feel. And sure enough, the fish were like rubbing their noses. So the fish can feel, I don't know about the scientists, but the fish weren't having trouble feeling. So the question is, why did we even wonder, right? They're vertebrates, they have all the mechanisms, all the same mechanisms that we do. We have seen that they work in groups, they can remember, they can do mazes. They even, without hands, use tools. Right, so these are amazing beings. And of course, why is it that anything that's a little closer to how we behave is, gets more esteem from us, right? Frankly, I don't care if they can use tools and 
You know, I don't care if they can do mazes, this is a human thing. But the important thing is recognizing that these are complex beings. Even if they weren't, this is a being. And really, I think for most of us in the room, that's all that matters. Fishing is an incredibly destructive industry. And one of the main reasons for that is, of course, the methods used. So I will talk first about the methods that are used and why they're destructive. What are the two methods, two main methods of fishing? Who can tell me? Nets and? Nets and? Lots on the end of the lines? Hooks, nets and hooks. All right, so here is one of the netting methods. And you know, if you think they can pull in 100 million tons of fish in one net. And I love how like the fishes are talked about in tons, right? It, they're not tons. I, I'd like to know how many individuals, and if you look in this picture, you can see the individuals in the net here, um, how big that net is and how much it pulls in. And uh, some of the trawlers can pull in five tons of just one trawler. And that's, in some sense, it's almost the least of the damage, the one, the haul that they bring in in the net. So the methods are extremely problematic. And um, when we think about it, when we look at the things that we're doing to the sea, so we've destroyed their homes, we've taken their homes, and we've killed and eaten them, right? So this is the reality of what we do to the fishes and the seas. How many of us have actually seen a tuna fish, so right, there's what they look like. And I was, I tried really hard when I was finding my slides, I wasn't gonna show you dead fish. You know, I did it in a couple of slides. But generally, we need to see fish as fishes and not um, as something dead and edible. And it's, not, it's even kind of hard to find some images of that. They live in a very different world than we live in. So one of the things about our fisheries is that we are overfishing. So 80% of the fisheries, at a minimum, are maxed out and beyond what is sustainable. 80%, that's a lot of our fisheries. So what we did was, of course we weren't sensible enough to stop fishing, what we did was we moved to different fishes. And I'm old enough that I can tell you I've seen all the new fishes come on. I remember when I was a kid when Pollock arrived on the scene, for example. So we have moved from one fish to another as salmon have disappeared. We started, you know, the factory fishing and, you know, we've moved to fishes that nobody had heard of or ate before. We went from the terrestrial to the, the fish that were on top to the fish that were underneath. So the orange ruffy is one of those fish that was underneath. And it can live down uh, hundreds of feet um, under the water. It's a fish that can live for 120 years. It's a fish that doesn't have young until it's 20 years old. So this is a fish from the deep, deep sea. And one of the things about going uh, underneath to find the fish is that we, we don't know what's happening. What we know is they're sure harder to find now as uh, with most of the fish that are now deep sea fish. And we're, so we're fishing in an area where it's harder for us to know what's happening with the fishes. So here's an example of the hooking, uh, the hooks that are used. So there's two ways. There's the, the hooks that drop down and there's the hooks that go along the ocean. And they're basically designed the same, but one goes um, across the ocean and one goes deep down into the ocean. So at different levels, different types of fishes can be snagged. And the spiny-tailed skite is another uh, deep sea fish that almost got put on the endangered list, but with whatever evidence they had, they decided that, no, we're not gonna worry about that fish just yet. Uh, but the point is, these deep sea fish are at risk, and it's very hard for us to know how the fish deep, deep in the water are actually doing. Here's the long lines that go horizontally. Now, the important thing to know about the methods of fishing is that they are indiscriminate. So if there's one thing you remember to tell the next fish eater that you're talking to, it's for them to remember that the methods are indiscriminate. So what that means is, anybody that grabs that hook is dead. Now, I worked on a fishing boat for a grand total of a week when I was desperate, very young, hungry, eating peanut butter sandwiches and had nothing, nowhere. I just didn't have anything in this fishing boat. I was up in Alaska uh, working on a fish gut line, processing fishes, and uh, that job ended. And so I ended up on this fishing boat. I don't know what I was thinking, right? It was one of those disconnects where, I don't know. But anyway, there I was on the fishing boat, and we were long lining. So these are long lines. So we dropped the long lines over, and we would come up with fish, and the fish would just be dropped on the deck, and they were left there to suffocate. Uh, you, you could watch them die if you were so inclined to do. But the other thing that came up on these, uh, on these hooks was 
lots of things. Well, for example, birds that had grabbed the hook as it went down had been drowned and were pulled back up, which is why at the first stop I got off the boat. I realized, I don't know what I was thinking, but killing animals is really not my thing. Yeah, live and learn. All right, so 30,000 seabirds are killed by uh, these hooks annually. They're caught and drugged down and drowned and pull up. And of course, remember with indiscriminate, it means that sea turtles and other endangered species, endangered birds, albatrosses, uh, they are all killed by these hooks. These, that's what, I guess, indiscriminate means. So I want to be sure that we know that it isn't just the ocean fishing. So where I live in Montana, there's all sorts of people, uh, there's a, fishing is really big. So these hooks, of course, get lost. I find them fairly frequently and uh, they do damage. They do damage to the wildlife that's out there. So with indiscriminate methods, you end up killing more than you'd bargained for. So even if somebody's willing to eat a tuna, are they really willing to kill all the other animals that are killed with those? So with, uh, with nets, remember that they also can become ghost nets. Right? That means that the net gets away. So you have one of these floating nets, it breaks loose, and it goes into the ocean. So at that point, it's killing anything that gets tangled in it. It's just like this hook when it gets loose. They keep on killing. So the fishing methods are indiscriminate, and uh, they have a life beyond the life with uh, the people who are actually fishing. So this is Yellowstone Lake. and. Um, Yellowstone Lake, of course, is very near where I live in Montana, and it's an example of some of the problems of fishing that never come up. So it has introduced to it a lake trout that is not native, and the lake trout really enjoys the baby fish that are native when they're young. And in a very short time, it has completely changed the ecosystem of Yellowstone Lake. So what they're doing is they're doing these massive kills to try to get rid of the lake trout. So Fish are suffering, ecosystems are damaged, and all because of what? Because fishers thought, gosh, it'd be nice to have this big fish right here in Yellowstone Lake. So another thing in the United States, our parks are places that are supposed to be completely preserved and protected. But there is fishing. And not only that, but in Yellowstone, there were only a few lakes that initially had uh, fishable fishes. And now pretty much all of them do, and that's purposeful stocking. They've put the fish in the lakes for the fishers. So these are the sorts of effects of fishing that nobody thinks about, effects of, on, on our ecosystems. So again, environmentalists, this might matter more to them than it does uh, what they're actually eating when they think of the environmental effects. <clears throat> so here's an example of the um, drift nets that float and the fish swim in and get their gills caught. But of course, uh, many others also get caught, especially when they become ghost nets. This is a bottom trawl, right? So these are some of the most destructive nets that are out there. They have weights to keep them down that on each side that weigh about five tons. And it's just like uh, a bulldozer running through the rainforest. So the ocean floor, and I love this picture, right? You'd think it was a desert. But ocean floors are not deserts, right? So down there you would see that's where the coral and the life and that's where the the fishes and the, and the ecosystems, that's where they breed and start the next generation. And these heavy trawls drag right over them and just leave them crumbled and destroyed. So not only are the nets catching everything in sight, but they leave behind them a rubbled, damaged, destroyed, uh, lifeless zone. All right, so briefly, sorry for this picture, giving you a sense of what these nets catch and why they are uh, just incredibly um, uh, insensitive to living beings and to ecosystems. 6,000 turtles annually are brought in along with the 30,000 birds. And remember that again, this is ecosystems and this affects more than just uh, the fishes that we think of as being eaten. So bycatch, that's called bycatch, the things that are caught that weren't intended. So the vaquita is this wonderful little porpoise that lives in the warmest waters of any porpoise. You can see how they look. They're absolutely beautiful. They're about my size. They're about five feet and about 120 pounds. And so they're you know, slightly smaller than I am. And they have one baby every two years. The baby's about two feet long and about 17 pounds. And these little, who's heard of a vaquita that's, that's here? Heard them on the news? They're starting to hit the news. I've been watching them for about 10 years and they went from 
you know, having fairly sure that there were a few hundred of them left. There are now some estimates say there's only 30. Others say there might still be one or perhaps a little more than 100 of these beings left. So what's destroying them is nets. So they are getting caught and by about 30 of them a year. So you can look in the near future, as long as fishing is allowed in that area, we can look in the near future for the vaquita not being around anymore. But the only way to protect it is to stop the fishing because the nets are indiscriminate, the methods are indiscriminate, and there's no way to protect endangered species. Shrimp gets the award for the worst bycatch offender. One to 14, right? Is it really worth it for all that you kill? And they also, 25% uh, of the mangroves um, destruction comes from shrimp farmers. And of course, the mangroves are like the corals. They're a place of breeding and a place of security where the beings of the sea can produce the next generation. The bluefin tuna um, is another animal, another animal, another fish of the seas that uh, I think it's important to know about. There, who's, who has heard of the bluefin tuna? Ah, this one's been a little better known. So there, these are, of course, one of the very few warm-blooded fish. And until I started studying this, I didn't know there was any warm-blooded fish. This is a warm-blooded fish. And it's one of the fastest swimmers. It's one of the longest distance swimmers. They can swim the entire, across the entire ocean in, 21, in about 21 days. And they're, when they swim through the water, their color, they're just so beautiful. Their sheen and their shine. And they are, of course, suffering from fishing. And in Japan, one of these can sell for, by the pound, it's, one fish can sell for about $100,000. Their flesh in Japan can be more expensive than the price of silver. So why is it that we can't protect them when they're worth that much money? We're not gonna be able to protect them. And with so much fishing, juvenescence is when the fish who breed younger in life are the ones who are able to breed because the others are fished out. So that's basically what the idea of juvenescence is. And many of the fish are suffering from juvenescence. They're getting smaller and smaller because the ones who can breed are the ones who breed younger. And as far as we know, this is an irreversible effect of fishing. And you can see here that the bluefin tuna, um, it is not only getting smaller in size, but actually catching them and finding them. You can see that they were finding about um, eight per 100 hook set, and now they can find about one. So they're disappearing and they're shrinking. When I rode on that uh, fishing boat, one of the things I noticed was that the guy who was fishing, the guy who ran the boat, which was called the Silver Quest, he didn't want anything in the seas that might compete for the fish. So he had a gun and he would shoot anything that was in the seas that he thought ate fish, including sea lions and seals. And uh, he, he just had no respect for life and no respect for the fact that he was part of a larger system. It was all about money for him. And the, so one of the effects of, of eating and buying fish is that you keep people like him on the waters who are competing with the other animals. And we're starving them out. We're winning. This is the endangered stellar sea lion. It uh, depends on pollock and other fish to survive, but uh, they're moving north in search of food. And um, we're putting them, people who are eating the fishes are making it so that they don't have anything to eat. And here's the California Marine Mammal Center, and they, of course, try to work with the hungry little beings and the ones that have lost their parents that come in. Isn't this just the cutest little being? I just find this one quite irresistible. So another effect, um, so animal agriculture has a couple uh, links with the fishing industry. One is that the bycatch that comes in, they will pay to feed fish products to cows and chickens and pigs because it's a cheap source of protein. The other effect is that, of course, animal agriculture is the cause of dead zones. You all know about dead zones, yeah? Everybody? Okay, this is good. This is a change over the last decade, which is really nice. So these are examples of dead zones. And right now, my lovely country has the largest dead zone. We're so proud. So, and it's caused, of course, the Mississippi River. It comes right down from all the animal agriculture that's upstream. But look at how, uh, how this has grown, how it came along, and, and just exponentially. And this ended in 2006, and it has shot up. There's something like 400 
or more dead zones now around the world. And they don't just come intermittently, they come and stay. So dead zones are one of the effects of animal agriculture, but they are also something that stresses and kills not just the fishes, but all the living beings that are in the waters because they can't live without oxygen. So here's all the places that have dead zones. So here we are, lovely, lots of nice dead zones there. Here's the giant one that we've created. And I like it, like even little New Zealand, right? They're animal agriculture place, so they have their own gigantic dead zone going on there. Here's what they look like. There's the Gulf of Mexico flooding filthy water out to kill the beings that live in the sea. And a more recent picture, um, I just got this off the internet last night, and I, I know that it's a new picture because I've been kind of watching this, and I know that it's getting worse and worse. So the things that we see that look like the shining and glistening water is just really a sea of dead beings. And when they go, remember, it's whole communities, it's whole ecosystems that are damaged and destroyed. And so eating fishes just further stresses the system. Acidification is also part of climate change, part of warming of water. So acidification um, makes it so that our coral reefs can't survive. And there's a lot of studies going on to act actually look at what the bleaching and acidification is about. But what we're really clear is it's about us. It's about the warming waters. It's about animal agriculture. It's about pollutions. And these are, you can see the difference between a living reef here and the dead one here. Um, that will not be sustaining the next generation of living beings in the waters. Here is a bleaching coral. Uh, and the climate change really helps, it heats them up, they're very sensitive, the corals are very sensitive, and they, they grow very slowly, something, even the fastest ones only grow a few inches a year. So some people want to turn to aquaculture. Well, we can surely do something to keep our fish habit. Right? It's like the sustainable meat. It's like the, the happy farms, right? The happy death of slaughter from the green farms. No, it's not the answer, right? We all know that. The answer is to actually change what we're doing, to eat something else. Try some red beans. You'll like them. So aquaculture is a disaster. It, is a, it creates as many problems as uh, it is supposed to solve. And I think one of the main things is, you know, many of the fish, like the salmon, they're carnivores, so they're feeding them bycatch. So it actually, in the end, if you go by pounds or numbers, either one, you're killing more fish than you're saving with the aquaculture. And I think another thing that's really important to notice uh, is just, in general, they damage the ecosystem. Some of the fish escape. So these factory farm fish who are filled with um, um, antibiotics are stronger than the wild fish, and they escape and breed with the wild fish and create slightly different fish, and they are, of course, because of the antibiotics, they're stronger, and so they can bring diseases from their tight little pens out into the wild fish and uh, kill a lot of wild fish with whatever they're carrying. Also, the predator control, that's, uh, that's like the guy in the boat that's shooting the seals. Anything naturally, I mean, I live in a place where I see the bears will show up if there's something to eat. The eagles will show up if there's something to eat. So predator control is a government program in the United States where the government shows up and pays for it themselves to help these people uh, to keep the rest of the living world from actually consuming anything that humans might consume. So there's a lot of killing that goes on outside of just killing the fishes. Uh, and the labels are not dependable. So here's an example, and this is just a quote that I took out of Eating Earth. And what you see here is that anyone who thinks they're going to eat sustainable fishes, think again. So what the study showed was that 30% um, were mislabeled. So they seem to have kind of a, well, we'll call it sustainable fish, and then we'll put that label on it. But what's actually in there, you have no way of knowing, and that's what this test showed. Substitutions included, of course, endangered uh, fishes because so many of the fishes that we're eating are endangered. So the oceans are in a state of collapse, and this is a scientific, Pew Oceans Commission, a scientific assessment of our seas. We've killed 90% of, uh, of the big predators, so when you kill the kind of the flagship species, it of course has ripple effects down through the whole community. Do you know that our salt in our bodies is the same ratio as that in the sea? 
we crawled out of the oceans. And if we're not careful, we're gonna, you know, the life in the oceans could be very symptomatic of what's gonna happen to the rest of the planet. And we're not paying attention to what's happening because we can't see it. But we are very, we remain very ocean dependent. Just for example, half of the planet's oxygen comes out of our ocean and the plants that are actually in the, in the ocean absorb five times as much of the carbon dioxide as the tropical forests. So these are things, again, that, you know, how many of us know that? These are critically important things about the seas around us. They have 168 times the volume of living space because it's, you know, it's something that's kind of all around you. Any of us who swim know what that feels like. Uh, it covers 70% of the surface and 80% of all life is found in the oceans. This is a critical, eco, critical set of ecosystems, just millions of ecosystems. And many of them are so deep, we don't, we don't really even know what's there. We're still discovering things. And of course, the beings in the ocean are also individuals, amazing individuals. And as I say, we've killed 90% of the large fish. The fisheries are maxed out, 80% of them, and yet we're still fishing, and we pull 100 million tons of living beings from the oceans every year with our fisheries. If you look at these fishes, all right, if you look at this fish, just look at her. Look at her looking out of her dark eye. Imagine what that feels like. It must kind of be, like, I guess, like the wind in our hair, what it must feel like for her uh, to go through the water and feel the, the ocean going through her very light, airy fins. And look at her tummy. She's been happily eating. She looks quite well fed. So this is an individual being, right? This is a fish. This is like me. This is someone having a life. And if we don't speak up for this fish, she will not be valued in our cultures. She is not valued in our cultures. People don't look at her and recognize her for what she is as an individual. So when we look out to the oceans, we see this shiny, beautiful surface. And it's so wonderful to go to the beach or to be on the water. It does something to us. It's a peace. It's a rhythm. But we can't see what's going on underneath the oceans. And that's why it's allowed to continue. And so we need to have the answers when we bump into someone who says, well, I've gone vegan except for fish, <laughs> right? We need to politely say, ah, oh, it's so great, you're headed toward vegan. You don't need to say, you know, it's not vegan when you're eating fish. What you need to tell them about is the methods of fishing, is the acidification and dead zones that are stressing our oceans, and that little fish with her dark eyes that lives in the ocean, that it's up to us to protect. And we need to say things like, let's get some marine re reserves going. Let's get some international protections, because you can't protect a fish like the orange ruffy that lives in international waters unless you have uh, nations working together. And ultimately, we have to go completely, we have to go really fully, no fishes, no chickens, vegan. 